It's true Jesus gave up his life for his bride But his bride is the elect to whom his death is applied If on judgment day you see that you can't hide uh -huh. So by our actions we can condemn God's character But the second thing is we can do it by our teaching and by our theology Oh no, here comes the criticism And this is where the Apostle Paul really defends God's character and God's nature against uh, many of the charges against him of being an unjust judge. Hmm, I wonder if he's going to apply this to Calvinism in any way. Calvinism is a doctrine that I want to talk to you a little bit about because we mentioned it last Sunday. Calvinism is a doctrine that is very common amongst Protestant Christianity. I wish it was. All I see are liberal Pelagians all the time. And I believe it is a evil and wicked doctrine. I know. I hate it when people say that God's sovereign. I'm going to be very blunt about it. All right. I believe it's an evil and wicked doctrine. And I'll be, I believe that because it assaults God's character. What he means by that is that we don't believe that God loves everyone and wants all to be saved. It portrays God in a way that is absolutely contrary to the, what he has said about himself and about his character in the past. I will take vengeance on my adversaries, and I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh. Calvinism makes God out to be irrational and arbitrary in his judging. Apparently, he doesn't think that it's rational for God to want everyone to be saved, yet actively making it so that people cannot believe, such as hardening people's hearts. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. I suppose God was being arbitrary when he chose the prophets and the apostles as well. Or I guess God was being arbitrary when he chose Israel. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Who is Peter referring to when it says, but is patient towards you? Is it not his audience to whom he is writing to? To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That tells us what God's nature is like. He is a loving and gracious God. And he also has wrath and hatred. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would not perish. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. Whoever believes in him will not perish. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Does God love everyone? Yes. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places, and cut down your incense altars, and cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols, and my soul will abhor you. Does God want everyone to be saved? The Bible says that at least three times. He believes that, yet it says that God hardens people's hearts just as many times. In fact, even more. 1 Timothy 2.4 is about categories of persons. Not every single individual. Second Peter 3.9 is in reference to the believers, the elect. If God wanted all to be saved, then why did God harden the people's hearts that were listening to Christ in John chapter 12, verse 39? In the New Testament. Then why doesn't he do it if he has the power to do so? Arminians are usually surprised by this, but the answer is, for his good and holy purposes. And if he is, in fact, electing a certain group to be saved and not electing another group, why is he doing that? He's being arbitrary. He's being an unjust judge. If I fed everyone in Africa for an entire year, would I be unjust for not feeding everyone in Asia for an entire year? I had no obligation to do so in the first place. What was the conclusion of the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 20? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Does not God have the right to do what he wants with his own grace? Well, apparently Pastor Tim Warner does not believe so. Calvinism makes God out to be 
a bit of a monster. Because he created, according to Calvinists, he created the bulk of humanity to suffer in eternal torment. That's great for emotionalism, but it's not great for scripture. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? With no opportunity to be saved. Calvinism makes God out to be an egomaniac because he created these things and he's doing these things for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to display his glory. It is at this point when I begin to doubt a person's salvation. He does not begin to realize why God's glory would be an important thing. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God says in chapter 40 of Job, Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like His? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity? Clothe yourself with glory and splendor? This so-called pastor is saying that God does not deserve all the glory? This so-called pastor is saying that the great I am, the beginning and the end, the Redeemer, does not deserve all the glory? That God does not have the right over his own creation? So by our actions, we can condemn God's character. But the second thing is we can do it by our teaching and by our theology. But that's not why God is doing all these things. Now, God does get glory, and he ought to get glory, because he's the only one that really should, and, uh, should be worshipped, and the only one who is worthy to be worshipped. But only on your terms, huh? If God predestined some to hell for his own glory, apparently God is no longer worthy of that worship to Pastor Tim Warner. But he's not doing it to be worshipped. When God commands us to worship him and him alone, he's doing it for our good, not for his glory, for his good. So salvation isn't about Christ's sacrifice or God's grace, but it's all about us. So worship isn't about praising God, but it's about us. By nature, God is worthy of worship, so he doesn't have to do anything in order to be worshipped. His very nature demands it. Calvinism makes God out to be a liar. I already mentioned how Arminianism does this because on the one hand, they believe that God wants all to be saved, yet he actively hardens people's hearts so that they cannot be saved. I'll give you an example of this. Look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. You know this is talking about the New Jerusalem. You know this is talking about the New Jerusalem. You know this is talking about the New Jerusalem. Uh, he, he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. But go down to verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. He just got done talking about this river of living water that's going to be flowing from from God's throne in the New Jerusalem. He's telling people, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. So what is God doing? God is giving a blanket offer of salvation to everyone who will simply come. The man's stupidity is found in his own statements. This is about the New Jerusalem. What is the New Jerusalem? The New Jerusalem is heaven. Since this is in the context of the New Jerusalem, God is only speaking to the ones that have already been saved. He is only speaking to the elect, which by definition is not every single person that had ever existed. Why don't we read two verses before verse 17? Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The ones outside are the ones that will not be able to experience the New Jerusalem. The ones outside are the ones whom God is not speaking to. But what does Calvinist say? God has provided the way for only a small group to come, and he has barred the way to life to the rest of mankind. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. That's essentially what they say. So what does that mean then when we see offers like this that God makes to people generally? 
Whosoever does not mean that a person has the ability to do so in the first place. It just means those that do this, this will happen. But in the case for Revelation 22, he had the context wrong. When he says come, anyone who is willing may come. Even if it was in the context of every single person, Romans 3 says there are none that seek after God. The only ones that are willing are those whom God makes willing. And he can drink of the water of life freely. It's free. Unlike the grace that you demand from God, which makes it no more grace. What is God? If Calvinism is true, what is God doing here? He's giving an insincere offer, isn't he? Isn't that an insincere offer? If it is not really available to all, then why is God telling everyone that they can come? He labors upon this point to no end. It's in the context of New Jerusalem, so it's the people that are saved and not every single person in the world. So this man is really digging a ditch for himself. It's, it's insincere. We have the same thing in Genesis when God is speaking to Cain. You remember when Cain and Abel brought their offerings to God, and Cain, he gets all mad because God didn't accept his offering. You know what God said to Cain after that? He said, look, Cain, yes, you will also be approved. Right. But if not, sin lies at the door. He's telling Cain, look, you've got a choice. You can make a choice and you can be approved, Cain. Once again, it's a matter of cause and effect. God is telling Cain, if this happens, then this will happen. It is similar to Leviticus 26. It does not specify whether or not they have the ability of themselves to do so. It is a similar situation as in my last video when I was speaking on John chapter 5, verse 40. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. It is not saying that they had the ability to come to Christ that they may have life. It was only specifying that they didn't come to Christ. If you'll simply change your attitude. Was Cain among the elect? Not likely. He went out after that and murdered his brother and then God put a curse on him, right? Did God offer salvation to Cain? Yeah, he did. Well, if Cain's not one of the elect, if Cain could not be saved, which is what Calvinism will tell you, then God was insincere in his offer to Cain, and God was essentially mocking Cain. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. There is no free offer of anything, is simply an explanation of the facts. If this happens, then you'll get rewarded. If this happens, then you'll be cursed. Is that the kind of God that ought to be worshipped and served? He simply fails in showing that God would be mocking Cain. He makes a leap from that to saying that God does not deserve to be worshipped if that would be the case. Furthermore, God is shown to mock certain individuals in Proverbs 1.26, as well as Psalm 2.4. So simply because God mocks, does that mean he's not worthy of worship? A God who plays the bait and switch game on somebody. And you know what Calvinism is essentially, is it, it feigns humility for man. Total depravity and total inability, yes. And exalting God's sovereignty, supposedly. Giving purpose to all things and giving sovereignty to his grace. At the expense of his holiness. And it's Arminians that make up rules that God must follow for some reason. You say, God is not holy unless he gives everyone a chance, forgetting that no one deserves a chance in the first place. This is not found in scripture, and this is not an argument of scripture. It's based on your emotion and tradition. Of course, he doesn't mean a biblical definition of holiness, but only what he thinks holiness means, which includes weakness and failure to save those whom he wishes to save at the expense of his character. They claim to be exalting God and bringing man down on his part because man cannot have any part in his own salvation. Right? So man is dust and dirt and worse than scum, pond scum. All the false religions of the world is based on work salvation. Calvinism says we can do nothing of ourselves. And as the Apostle Paul said, I know within my flesh dwells no good thing. Mr. Warner hates the thought of being powerless, and he hates the idea of a sovereign God. And God is so great that he controls everything. Ultimately, Calvinism teaches that everything is done at God's direction and at God's command. And if you press that 
to its logical conclusion, it means that Satan himself is acting according to God's command. And if Satan is acting according to God's command, then who is ultimately responsible for all the wickedness and evil in the world? God. Which would be worse, God creating the devil, knowing exactly what would happen, and using him, and even predestining his actions according to his own good and holy will in order to bring glory unto himself, or a God that knows all of this evil is going to happen, and foresees that all of this evil, rape, murders, what have you, is going to happen, yet has no purpose or plan for any of it, yet creates it anyway, knowing that he'll have no control over it, and having purposeless evil in the world. Would you prefer a God that knowingly creates purposeless evil? Or would you prefer a God that works all things to his glory and to his good, holy purposes? God's not a holy God. Not only that, we, we talked about being an unjust judge, but if, if God created man in this awful state so that he can't even exercise his will to, to choose what is good, then why is God holding him accountable? Finally, we get to the cry of the Arminian. Why have you made me like this? You can't hold me accountable unless I'm free. What nonsense. The Bible never explains any of that. In fact, it teaches the opposite. The answer is, who are you, O oh man? To answer back to God, who are you, Pastor Tim Warner? To make a reply back to God, saying, why have you made me like this? Has not God the right over the clay? Has he not the right over his own creation? Apparently Timmy doesn't believe so. Why is he torturing him in hell forever and ever, when in fact, he only did what he could do. He had no other options. Ultimately, that's what Calvinism teaches. Is that, you know, they say that, they say that God is displaying his justice when he does that, but that's not justice. There is never a discussion of a person needing to be free in order to be held accountable for his sins. God hardened Pharaoh's heart and God sent Pharaoh to hell. God hated Esau before he was able to do good or evil. In Isaiah 10, God sent the king of Assyria to attack Israel, yet God held the king of Assyria accountable for that, and he punished him for it. God uses evil for his good purposes. We only punish people when they make the wrong choices, isn't that right? When they have the opportunity to do good, but they refuse to do good, that's when they deserve to be punished. I would love for him to present some biblical evidence. Dogmatic repetitions do not make good theology. Because of their choices. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We weren't free. We were dead. Truly, I believe this. On the cross, my old self was crucified with Jesus. 